Super Mario Maker is finally here, which means the potential for incredible Mario levels has arrived. I predict that we'll see nothing but the most ingenious levels by the creative minds who made them, right? Well, no, actually, a lot of them are pretty bad. Just a lot of enemy spamming and near impossible tasks. Now, I get the urge to want to do this. I mean, sure, we all put a giant Magikoopa on top of three Bowsers because it was fun once, but one only has to boot up 100 Mario Challenge on expert mode to see the depth of sheer mayhem in these levels. At first I was disappointed, but it made me reflect on how hard game design actually is. We often take intuitively designed games for granted, but when a blank canvas is placed in front of us, it's hard to know where to start. So today we're going to talk about how to make a good Mario level. Tips and tricks and do's and don'ts. But there's a lot to talk about, so I've enlisted some help. Say hi to CJ from What's With Games! Oh, hey. Uh, Alright. Let, let's dive in. You want to take the first one, CJ? Sure. First off, playtesting is an important part of making a great level, but you can't just playtest the level yourself. As the maker of the level, you know exactly what you're supposed to do and how you're supposed to do it. Not everyone is you. In fact, no one is you. It's pretty unlikely for other people to play your level the exact same way you do. That's why feedback from other players is so important. It also might not be obvious to other players where you're supposed to go next. Consider leaps of faith. This occurs when the player is forced to make a risky move due to lack of direction from design. These kinds of issues can easily be fixed in Super Mario Maker by using coins and or arrows to direct the player. Coins are especially important when the player needs to land in a very specific spot. Players follow coins. If you make a trail of coins leading to death, you're doing it wrong. It's important to consider the power of coins and arrows in telling the player where they need to go. Playtesting is essential because your mind won't be the only one to play the stage. I would even take it a step further and encourage you to draw out your levels. Yeah, like physically draw them out on paper. You'd be surprised how much more creative you can get when your only limit is your imagination. The easy tendency would be to just start from the editor, you know, cut out a step. But it's harder to see the grand picture of your level when you're only looking at it a screen at a time. Let your mind run wild with ideas and then worry about the logistics of the actual editor once you have the whole level planned out. Let's talk about something more specific. Lakitu. Or is it Lakitu? Man, I never know. You know what? I'm just gonna call him Jorge. You don't need me to tell you that putting an unfathomable number of Jorge's at the top of your stage is a bad idea. However, it's a bad idea for more reasons than you'd think. Most people just see this as an extremely hard and unfair obstacle, but it goes beyond that. If you design a whole level down here and the player somehow manages to defeat Jorge, they'll usually be able to take his cloud, effectively rendering the rest of the level meaningless, whether it was designed well or not. The chances of the player managing to do this is just increased the more Jorge's there are. If you do decide to implement Jorge into your level, make sure to place him in a reasonable spot so that the player can't just skip everything. Or perhaps you expected this, in which case you can reward the player for managing to get Jorge's cloud by putting something up here. But keep in mind that the player still may have the opportunity to skip the entire level. Another reason people don't like Jorge is because he's unpredictable. In fact, anything random needs to be considered before you place it down in your level. If the player can't replicate the same movements every time they play, it may not be as fun for them. I've seen levels where Bowser is just placed in as a regular enemy, but his AI is completely random. This can lead to unfair deaths or even situations that are impossible some of the time. It's fine to have a Bowser as a boss, but just keep the randomness in mind if you're thinking of going crazy with him. Make sure there's always a clear way out of any jam they might get themselves into. Sometimes in designing a level, you come across a segment that's less about acting and more about thinking. I'm talking about puzzles. Puzzles shouldn't be too easy nor too hard, though it can be a challenge to balance the two. In addition to this, puzzles should be satisfying to solve. Keep in mind that Super Mario Maker doesn't allow you to make checkpoints, so if the player loses, they'll have to start the entire level from the beginning. Tying this into puzzles, designers need to recall that players may be forced to solve their puzzles more than once. And if the puzzle isn't fun to solve more than once, this can quickly turn into a chore for the player. Puzzles should try to balance both intuition and skill. A boring puzzle isn't fun twice. Take a look at this level here. You get to this part where you have to hit these hidden blocks to reveal a path upon which you can long jump. But if you lose later in the level, you have to go through the entire ordeal of hitting each block again. It can get monotonous. Isn't that your level? Uh, yeah, don't worry about that. Hey, at least you use hidden blocks in a good way. In most Mario games, a hidden block is either used to create a new path or help the player reach new heights if they're explorative. This is not a good use of hidden blocks. It's not fun, it's frustrating. And this is even worse. An inescapable trap is just bad design. It forces the player to restart, which should only be caused by the player's mistakes. It's artificial difficulty, not a true challenge. You can make a really hard level without being cheap about it. Now, it's not a bad idea to reward the player for accomplishing certain parts of the level, but a designer has to keep in mind how some players may respond to having power-ups. Generally, power-ups will allow the player to take one or two extra hits before losing 
losing a life, but this can easily be exploited. For example, if you see this kind of obstacle in your level, a player may feel the risk isn't worth it and might just stroll right through, taking advantage of the invincibility frames. This can be made worse by rewarding the player at the wrong times. For example, if you approach this segment with Big Mario and there's immediately another mushroom or flower afterward, there's no sense in acknowledging the challenge. Most players would just use the invincibility frames, essentially just circumventing the obstacle. The player's primary goal is to beat the stage, not always to explore everything in it. You want the player to experience your level, not skip it. This might seem obvious, but another tip is to take cues from actual Mario games. Part of the reason we all love this little plumber is because his levels are beautifully designed. Most stages have a specific theme to them, and it will expand on that theme as you continue through the level. It'll increase in difficulty, normally ending with a final challenge, finishing strong, and not too long either. Keep your level to one major hurdle, not a marathon of them. Now, part of the reason I felt so invested in Mario Maker is because I actually created my own Super Mario World ROM hack way back in the day. I like to think it was challenging, but never unfair or frustrating. The goal was always clear and normally had a gimmick or theme attached to each level. For example, in one stage you had to follow a bullet through the entire level and then use him for a massive jump with Yoshi at the end. Now let's say I wanted to recreate this level in Mario Maker. Let's use this idea as a specific example of all the tips we've been talking about so far. Now, there's a few differences between Mario ROM hack and Mario Maker, a big one being the lack of information blocks. I would always put instructions for the player in these blocks in my ROM hack, but since they aren't here now, we need to think of how to tell the player through gameplay. One, you could make the title hint at the objective, I've called this one bullet chasers. And two, placement of objects and good use of arrows and sound effects can tell the player if something is important. The bullet blaster is placed very prominently here at the beginning, and I've placed arrows telling the player to wait, as well as a sound effect to catch their attention. The floor never goes away in this level until the very end. This is on purpose, so the player can't interfere with the bullet at all. Plus, it makes the bullet's actions fairly inconsequential, other than scrolling off screen. The player needs to follow the bullet through an increasingly difficult stage until they reach a Yoshi, also prominently displayed with a sound effect as well. Now the final challenge. A gauntlet of ice and enemies, piranha plants that Yoshi can walk on, and the final leap. I've placed coins to hint at the player what to do and when exactly to time their jumps. The goal is as clear as I felt I could make it, and you're rewarded with some fireworks after completing it. Interesting fun fact, I actually playtested this level you made, Snow, but I actually played it a little bit differently. Near the beginning, you put a Goomba and a Koopa. I found this as a natural opportunity to take the Goomba with me, using him as a weapon. However, shortly afterward, we crossed the Sea of Spikes. I can't rush ahead since I have to keep the bullet on screen, but now the Goomba is a ticking time bomb before he wiggles free and damages me. By the time I reach the end of the spikes, I feel anxious and ready to throw the Goomba at the first enemy I see. And you know what? It felt awesome! It added a new layer to the already urgent task of timing myself to keep the bullet on screen. It was really cool, unintentional good design. Hmm, unintentional good design. New show coming this fall. You mean autumn. What? Finally, it's easy to forget just how different each of the Mario games are. For a series that's often criticized for not adding new elements to the formula, Mario's actually shaken it up quite a bit over the years. Super Mario Maker allows you to make levels in the style of four different Mario titles. Super Mario Bros., Super Mario Bros. 3, Super Mario World, and New Super Mario Bros. U. Each game gets its own special power-up. Super Mario Bros. gets the amiibo costume, Mario 3 gets the leaf, Mario World gets the feather, and Mario U gets the propeller shroom. Also, Mario U is the only one to have wall jumping. Be sure to use these differences to your advantage when crafting your level. As you can see, there's a lot that goes into designing a stage for a platform game. Although there are heaps of levels that make me want to pull my hair out, I've seen a lot of creativity in the game as well. People are really thinking outside the box, and I hope we'll see even more ingenuity as more people try their hand at it. More than anything else, keep in mind that the player wants to have fun. Use that as motivation to design a level that you would have fun playing as well. Difficulty can be exciting and accomplishing if it's done right, you just need to plan ahead to make it that way. Thanks for watching, now go make something unique. Hey guys, I'm Snowman. If you enjoyed, please give this episode a thumbs up and give us a comment of what you think makes a good Mario level. If you've made a stage in Mario Maker that you think has good design, put it in the comments as well and we'll check it out. A huge thanks to CJ for helping out with this video. You can check out his channel, What's With Games, here. If you'd like to see more videos on game design, check this series out as well. I hope this helped in your Mario making endeavors and I'll see you all next time.